My name is Sally Dixon, Sally Foy Dixon. And I met James, if I knew exactly when I met James, I could tell you that. But I believe I actually met him face to face in 1972. Now, if that is wrong, it's in the early 70s. I'll put it that way. I brought him to uh, um, Carnegie Museum of Art for the film department. Uh, I was beginning to show all of the avant-garde filmmakers. To me, they were the artists of the 20th century, uh, the, f the film form, or the art form of the 20th century, and I wanted to get it out. And uh, he was one of them. He was one of the main ones from the West Coast. Oh, what a delight he was, and what a sense of humor he had, and how deeply he went into conversation not just light social speaking. He would immediately get into something. And I thought, ooh, this is an interesting man. He goes deeply in. And he sees everything. It was, being with him was enough evidence of what he was. You didn't have to work on it. Oh, I thought they took it they kept it and they took it. They took it forward from films of the, of the past when film first opened. I'm talking turn of the century. Uh, Melies, uh, um, who were the others? Uh, the names I'm trying to remember. Um, well, I was thinking of the American. Uh, I gave you the only French one. Charlie Chaplin. Charlie Chaplin, <laughs> Charlie Chaplin and, and, um, and my other favorite. James Broughton's films picked up on the films of the world that began with the beginning of film in the 20th century, the end of the 19th and 20th century, like Méliès from France and, and um, Charlie Chaplin from America, and on up from there. And, uh, uh, and he was keeping, he was keeping uh, the look of films that we had seen, parts of the look of films that we had seen before from those earlier films, and all of them, or many of them, with tongue-in-cheek, with sense of humor, which he certainly had, but going deeply into the whole person, into the heart, into the soul. He made a film at my house. Yes, he did. He made it in the dining room, if you can imagine, um, because you wouldn't be able to see it from the, the front room. <laughs> And it was mainly with, with nude women. He was doing the human body. And he wanted these two women to be undressed, as it were, so that the film could be uh, the, the um, holiness, the wholeness, and the holiness of the human body. And uh, it was marvelous. I think it's a beautiful little film. It's not a long film. What it was like having him work in my house was interesting because he was, we were always talking about work there. And he always stayed at my house, so we'd get up and have breakfast and be talking about what he was, how he wanted to make, what he was imagining, what he was going to have in it, and so on. And uh, so it came out very naturally, and we'd, we'd, you know, we'd be sitting having breakfast at the dining room table, and then that's where he was going to shoot it. So we'd take the things off the table and move the table out, and, and he'd shoot the film. It seemed a very natural and normal and easy thing for him. And uh, so it went. Oh, his own life made him tick. He'd accepted his, his own life. That's what made him tick. Uh, he went back to, to uh, both the dark side and the light side the bad, the good, uh, the funny, the sad, the you name it. He accepted it all, and it made him whole and holy, <laughs> as I said before. It really did. Oh, my, I haven't thought of that. There was nothing he said that didn't light me up, spark me get me going. Nothing. How he saw everything. How he saw. How he thought. How he saw the humor in everything I loved. 
and he saw the sadness. He put it all together. Oh, well, I will. I love reading his poems. I love reading them. This is one of my favorites. I think this is my first favorite, and whether it's because it's the, well, I don't know. Let me read it. It's called This Is It. Wait, I have to put my glasses on. <clears throat> this is it. This is really it. This is all there is, and it's perfect as it is. There is nowhere to go but here. There is nothing here but now. There is nothing now but this. And this is it. This is really it. This is all there is, and it is perfect as it is. That is Broughton. <laughs> I might add, that is Broughton. <laughs> he got very much into Zen and Buddhism and world religions as a whole, and uh, um, which was accepting, assuming, knowing, accepting that everything in the human body, on the face of the earth, in this universe, the wholeness of it all was the holiness of it all, and it was all there, and that was it. <laughs> Without question, James and I became great friends almost immediately. <clears throat> it began the moment we met, I think, my friendship with James, and it has lasted out his entire life. It is still with me. Uh, I feel it is still with me. I feel he is still with me. Um, and I will see him after I go. Um, uh, no, it just, it was his openness his ability to, to see, to enter everything, to question, to accept what he didn't know, uh, to seek what he wanted to know, all of it. Uh, and just his joy of living, accepting all the dark sides, the light sides, accepting it all, that so moved me. And he talked about it so openly and simply. There was no, for me, there was sort of no fat in his language, or even in his films. Uh, it all was a gift. He was a gift. He was a gift in my life, is a gift in my life. Well, we, when he would begin mentioning those things, I thought, oh, we could discuss this. And so we would get into, into deep discussions, and we, uh, we would begin talking even about other world religions till we realized we were all accepting other world religions and that they each took their own form, but it was all dealing with the same thing. And then we'd simply hug, and uh, there was no more to say. We'd just look at each other and nod and hug and go from there. <laughs> James came as a delight, a surprise. I don't know, I was, he, he, he from the very beginning, James, one of the big immediate surprises was his openness to everything. So then I was always wondering, well, what's next? So it wasn't as much a surprise as an expectation, and yet what the thing was, was the surprise. Oh, a number of things. <laughs> James, James would get angry. He, he never, there was nothing in himself he didn't allow. Let me put it that way. And um, it's funny, I'm not remembering one of his angers at the moment but I'm remembering that it happened again and again, and I'd sit back when it happened, and I don't remember him ever being angry with me. I remember him being angry with others and with things and with timing, but I'm not remembering specifics, I'm sorry. That's mm. okay, I remember him getting angry when people cleared the table before everybody was finished. Oh, that would do it, because, because feasting of all kinds was his thing. 
And at the table, that's one of the open, clear feastings. Sorry, old dear. And, uh, oh yeah, that makes good sense. Thank you for that one. <laughs> what didn't? <laughs> what didn't make James laugh? Oh gosh. Uh, well, and he was a good laugher. I mean, it was, it was great laughter that he had. I would always just, it was almost like music. Um, out it would come and up and down and it was good. What made him laugh? I see I'm not remembering what made him laugh any more than I'm remembering what made him angry. It was just one of his gifts. So was his anger. <laughs> I mean, what wasn't about him? Oh. He seemed at peace. He seemed ecstatic. Well, he, he could seem ecstatic before that at certain times. But with Joel, I won't say ecstatic because it, he, was, he was basking in peacefulness. In, uh, he was home. His heart was at home. I guess that's the best way to say it, that I can say it. And, uh, you know, all of his other moods would come and go, but there was a basis, there was a, oh, what's a word for it? There was a, mm, a center. He was at home in his own heart. And so was Joel. And they together made a third heart or circle uh, that they were both in together. Oh, I learned so much about living and dying and being in this body, this time, on this earth, in this universe, and accepting it all. Uh, visual, I became with him so aware of sound, of music, of, of, of visuals, music, movement, all being one, all working on one another, not boom, 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 though they would also do that, but Beyond that, they were working together. That he made me very conscious of. That was a big thing for him. It's a big thing in his films, all of them, I feel. All of them. And no fat. Oh, God knows. <laughs> I felt he taught me. He was older than I. I was. But we were ageless together. Having said he was old, he was older than I. But I somehow felt we had always known one another. Somehow. I think he felt that too. That we were, in a sense, our relationship was ageless. Not having to do with... Hmm. Oh, right here. <laughs> Where was his body strongest? Uh, surrounding his penis and his heart. They moved together. I felt it was his sexual energy that was his soul energy as well. Or I think it expressed itself sexually for him, his soul energy. Um, and that's in most of his films, many of his films, if not most of his films. Uh, and I, I think somehow that this was an expression that he wanted to get out there and make come alive in this country of ours, which he certainly did, um, to dismay for some and joy for others. And of course, his films in the 60s, I mean, the 60s was a time when that was coming alive in this country. His energy, 
his spiritual energy and his body energy. But it all took forms in the parts of his body, visually, orally, physically, I mean, you name it. The professional film developing companies would have nothing to do with nude bodies. They wouldn't, they wouldn't do it. So what he finally found, and I believe it was in San, I'm quite sure it was San Francisco, he found a, a, a film um, making place that did pornography films. And they agreed to develop this film, to print this film for him. Um, one night, overnight, after they had closed, apparently. And that's how it got done. Or that was what he told, that was my sense of it. <laughs> I trust it was true. I don't know that it was. I always assumed it was from what he said. I heard that story. He's never said that to me. I don't know whether it is true. I, it could be. That's an interesting thought, isn't it? I mean, I, I, I'm visualizing that at the moment. <laughs> well, the human body, without question, the human body, and his different takes on it, and all kinds of human bodies. He didn't just single out uh, all men, all women, etc., all ages. He, he, he embraced the range, kinds and ages and uh, forms. James Broughton is a star in my heart. James Broughton brought light to this universe. James Broughton brought awareness to all parts of living, the good, the bad, the ugly, the beautiful, the et cetera, et cetera. James Broughton had rhythm both of speech and music and movement, I mean, had, had grace. And his poems, tongue-in-cheek. James must have been born with his tongue in his cheek. And yet he went deeply into the sad and the deep and the tragic as well. Oh, it is without question there. Yeah. But he gets you into it. I mean, he invites you in with the tongue-in-cheek often, or the subject. In other words, things that, that, that would give you great pleasure right off the bat. And then you open up, and then he goes in with something that's going to presumably let you grow if you accept it. Or, in other words, your wholeness becomes wholer holier, <laughs> as he says, always, as you accept all. Yeah. He did interact with children. Um, I spent a weekend with, with them when he was married, and, and the children were there, and actually I slept in the little girl's bed. She slept somewhere else. And... Um, and so we sort of played and walked and did things with the children that weekend, but that's the only time I've seen him with his own children, other than at his funeral when his son was there. But um, I haven't seen him with other children except my own, but my boys would come and go, and, um, and they thought he was funny. He, they thought he was wonderful because he was funny. I think because he was funny, and he would look them right in the eye and talk to them. And he also liked good food, you know, so we would cook good dinners when he was there, <laughs> which was fun. Says, this is Sally's very own copy of her very own book. Live, love, laugh, leap. Sing, swim, sink, sleep. The only cure for misery, colon, Dare to act out what your soul nags you toward. <laughs> that is so James, sweet. and coming out of his mouth is, oh, 
I love Sally Dixon. <gasps> I love James Broughton. I love James Broughton forever and ever. And there he sits. May I put him there? A poet has to allow everything to happen to him. Exactly. Or he can make nothing happen for others. A poet has to let go in order to hold on. Poetry, like love and religion, is a glorious conjunction of sense and nonsense. Without joy, there is no wonder. Without wonder, there is no magic. And without magic, there is no poem. I don't really know anything unless I can feel it. If I like what it does, I go where it takes me. I say only what it tells me, and I try to stand by it. And I don't have to believe it if I know that I know. A message from my angel repeats over and over, attain the inevitable, allness is ripe. <gasps> Whoa, wonderful. That should be, that is the second poem. That is James. <laughs>